Spelsby Church in Oxfordshire is a church which I think has a really strange atmosphere. Very few of the thousands of churches I've been in over the years have made me feel uncomfortable, but this building really does. Bits of it are oddly gloomy and over-Victorianised, which probably accounts for the odd atmosphere. It usually does. Among the gloom are some really fine monuments to the Lee family, who in the 18th century, after one of their number married the illegitimate daughter of Charles II, were advanced from being baronets to being the Earls of Lichfield. And they lived in Ditchley Park, which is a large house built for them in 1722 by James Gibbs uh, in a park to the south of the village. Although these monuments are really rather splendid, that's not why I visited Spelsbury Church. I came here in search of the burial place of one of their relations, one of the most colourful and controversial characters of Restoration England, John Wilmot, the second Earl of Rochester. Now, some of you may have watched Johnny Depp play the Earl of Rochester's character in the 2004 biopic of his life of the Libertine, which is based on the play by Stephen Jeffries. Or you might have read about him in Graham Greene's 1974 biography of Rochester entitled Lord Rochester's Monkey. Rochester is a person who has fascinated countless people over the generations, primarily because he was a man of clear wit, personal charm and great intellect, who seems to have set himself, as many bright young men seem to do as they learn to live with themselves, on a path of self-destruction. Like many a rock star today, and he was the 17th century equivalent of a rock star, his life was short. He was dead by the time he was 33. The traditional story is that he died of syphilis. An alternative viewpoint is that he died of cirrhosis of the liver from excessive drinking. Some say he died of a combination of both. Whatever the actual cause of his death, his bright flame was snuffed out as a consequence of living hard and playing hard. This path of self-destruction that saw Rochester buried in Spelsbury Church before his prime was in many respects a consequence of the time he lived in and the circumstances of his upbringing. Like many of the great men of the Restoration period, his formative years had been affected by the English Civil War and the Commonwealth. His father Henry, who held the Irish peerage of Viscount Wilmot, was a career soldier, and as a staunch royalist he found himself on the losing side in the English Civil War. A companion of Charles Prince of Wales, it was Henry Wilmot who engineered the escape of Charles from England following the Battle of Worcester in 1651, and he went into exile with his king. Henry Wilmot was one of the key advisers of Charles, while the prince, later Charles II, was in exile. And as Charles owed Henry Wilmot his life, he rewarded him by making him Earl of Rochester. Due to these circumstances, John Wilmot, who was born in 1647, barely knew his father and was never to meet him again after 1651. Henry, his father, died in 1658 in Bruges and John succeeded to the earldom of Rochester when he was only 11. Not that he was treated as an earl, until the restoration of Charles II in 1660. John's father, Henry, the first earl, had no money and only had a small estate of his own at Adderbury in North Oxfordshire, which had been forfeited by Parliament. So the young John was both born and brought up at Ditchley Park in the parish of Spelsbury. His mother, Anne St. John, had married for her first husband, Sir Francis, and on his death she held Ditchley Park until her elder sons came of age. And Rochester grew up at Ditchley in a busy household that included his two elder brothers, Sir Henry and Sir Francis Lee, who were 10 and 8 years his senior, and his sisters. At the age of 12, Rochester went up to Oxford and entered Wadham College. And it was really here that he developed two great passions, a passion for poetry and, sadly, a passion for drinking. 
When Charles II was returned to the throne in 1660, everything then changed for Rochester. Charles felt a sense of obligation for the 14-year-old boy whose father had saved his life, and he granted him a £500 a year annuity. Charles liked Rochester and felt rather paternal towards him, and in 1661 the king packs the 15-year-old Rochester off on the Grand Tour for three years. The king actually pays for it. He sent on the tour to broaden his education and to broaden his mind, and Rochester returned to court a rather bombastic 18-year-old. Now, the king already had a bride in mind for Rochester when he returned to court in 1664, the bride in question was a young heiress called Elizabeth Mallet. Rochester was relatively poor and Elizabeth Mallet was a good financial match as she had inherited £2,500 a year. Rochester rather liked the idea, but there was one problem. There were other suitors. So in 1665, Rochester decided that he would ignore that and he abducted Elizabeth. For this, he was sent to the Tower and then had to serve a spell in the Navy. And after things settled down, he and Elizabeth eventually married in 1667. She was an extraordinarily tolerant woman. The court of Charles II, the Merry Monarch, was a place of larks, of revels, and of debauchery. Charles II was perhaps the most debauched of the lot. Uh, a place where a 17, 18, 19 year old aristocrat like Rochester could have some fun. It was of course a reactionary place and I think that reaction is in many respects understandable. England had been under the control of the Puritans who were without question Protestant extremists and the country had been a place of dour seriousness and misery for nearly two decades. A place where plays and masks were banned and Christmas puddings were contraband. If you suppress people in that way because you have an ideology, inevitably people react against that suppression. Sadly, the court of Charles II was therefore the perfect place for a clever young man to become a rake and a libertine. And there were plenty of rakes and libertines at the court of Charles II. Rochester found himself part of a group that included nobles, playwrights and poets who were known as the Merry Gang and their whole existence was focused on three places the playhouse, the tavern and the whorehouse on wine, poetry and women. And Rochester said himself towards the end of his life that for five years together he was continually drunk and not perfectly the master of himself and that led to him doing many wild and unaccountable things. Rochester seemed to push his luck with the king more than the other members of the Merry Gang and he just managed to get away with more than the others too. He could even be rude to the king's face and get away with it. He once famously said in the king's earshot, we have a pretty witty king whose word no man relies on. He never said a foolish thing and never did a wise one. The king is said to have replied, that's true, for my words are my own, but my actions are those of my ministers. Anyone else other than Rochester wouldn't have got away with that. He came close to committing treason on more than one occasion, but he was always forgiven by the king. In 1675, Rochester became enamoured with a 17-year-old actress called Elizabeth Barry, and he undertook to improve the quality of her voice and her performance. He had recently been granted by the king the office of ranger of the Royal Park at Woodstock, not far from his childhood home, and he would often take Barry to High Lodge, his residence there, which is now in the park of Blenheim Palace, and it was here that Rochester and Barry's daughter Elizabeth was born. In the last few years, his health deteriorated and his behaviour got worse. In 1676, after one of his associates had been killed in a drunken brawl with a night watchman after Rochester had threatened a constable, he fled in fear to Tower Hill, where he is said to have disguised himself as a quack doctor called Dr Alexander Bendo. He also impersonated 
Mrs. Bendo too. Dr. Bendo claimed to have the power to cure barrenness in women, and Rochester, dressed up as Mrs. Bendo, would receive consultations in a nearby bedchamber. What did Rochester think he was doing? Was this all a big joke, or was it just an excuse for him to get away with debauchery? Well, people did ask the question at the time, just how many children Rochester had fathered by the wives of unsuspecting citizens of London as he masqueraded as Dr and Mrs Bendo. His behaviour was appalling, and it did appall. Rochester died on the 26th of July 1680 at the age of 33 at High Lodge in Woodstock Park, apparently passing away without so much as a groan. His health had been declining for years. The story goes that his mother Anne had brought to his bedside her friend Gilbert Burnett, a clergyman who would go on in time to be Bishop of Salisbury and have a distinguished career as a historian. After Rochester's death, Gilbert Burnett made a big deal of telling everybody how he had brought the libertine to repentance, and he may well have done, but Burnett also had a reputation for somewhat embellishing the truth. Others said that Rochester had lost his mind towards the end of his life, that he was delirious, something that his mother, Burnett, and others denied. Rochester was facing certain death, and at such an untimely age, and it's not uncommon for people, if they've had a colourful and controversial past, to begin to reflect on their life and their behaviour, and look towards reconciliation with God. We will never know if he was truly repentant for his debauched ways, but the account of his deathbed conversion adds even more mystique to his life and reputation. As Anthony A. Wood, a contemporary of Rochester, said, he made a great noise in the world for his noted and professed atheism, his lampoons, and other frivolous stuff, and a great noise after his death for his penitent departure. For such a colourful and controversial person, it is surprising, perhaps, that his grave is not marked. Woodstock is but a few miles from Ditchley and from Spelsbury. Rochester is, therefore, brought to Spelsbury Church for burial and placed in a stone vault that already contained the coffin of his half-brother, Sir Henry Lee. It's under the Lee family chapel, which is at the east end of the north aisle of the church. This is that north chapel, and the burial vault is below the floor of it, accessed from the outside through a series of blocked-in steps. Rochester's burial place is not marked, quite simply as his family, in the male line at least, came to an end within a year of his death and no one had either the inclination or perhaps the financial means to erect a monument. That there is not even a floor slab to his memory is really unusual. Rochester's wife, Elizabeth Mallet, died in the summer of 1681, and she was buried in the vault too, her coffin placed on top of his. Their only son, Charles, who had become the third Earl of Rochester, would die in 1681 too, probably of smallpox, and his small coffin was added to the gloomy vault below Spelsbury Church. Fifteen years later, in 1696, Rochester's mother Anne, who had lost so many members of her family, would also join her sons and her grandson in the vault. The body of her first husband, Sir Francis, was already within, and that of her second husband, the first Earl of Rochester, had already been placed there in the 1680s, removed from Bruges, where it had initially been interred. So, there they all lie together. So much life, so much colour, so much hope, so much despair, so much potential lost in its prime. All were, in one sense or another, a victim of the distracted times in which they lived. Thirty years ago, the vault below the chapel containing their coffins was opened and the Vicar of Spelsbury and others entered and a series of photographs was taken of the interior. People were buried in three-part coffins in the 17th and 18th century. An inner wooden coffin clapped in lead was then contained within an upholstered outer wooden shell. Most of these outer cases had gone to expose the lead within. The coffins of Rochester and his wife Elizabeth Mallet were found, one on top of the other, the weight of Elizabeth's coffin crushing the lead of her husband's. 
Their coffins were identifiable by the coffin plates that were attached to them. Within were also funerary urns containing the viscera of the Earl and Countess of Rochester, packed round with sweet herbs. The coffin plates of John Wilmot, Elizabeth Mallet, his wife, and their son Charles were removed from the vault and are now in a glass case on the wall of the church tower, the only reminder to visitors of their burial within this church. Thanks very much for watching.